Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 5, Advanced Diploma in Procurement and Supply. This is Module 6, Category Management, and I'm going to cover Learning Outcome 1, which is to understand the approaches that can be used to develop category management strategies. So category management is a strategic approach. It combines looking at organising resources to focus on the most cost effective and significant areas of spend. It links to business strategies to sourcing initiatives and it can deliver significant greater results than conventional transactional based purchasing if it's applied effectively throughout the entire organisation. And it combines the conventional sourcing approaches and strategic sourcing to deliver overall results for a category. So on the screen you can see um, an example of a category profile. The aim is to develop and implement sourcing and contracting strategies that deliver the best value for an organisation and it's used extensively in large global businesses, national and local government and not-for-profit organisations. And a category manager um, manages a set of subcategories as a portfolio to meet the strategic objective of the business rather than just chasing cost savings. And they do this by combining detailed study of supply markets with deeper collaborative relationships with their suppliers. Now categories are defined by grouping controllable third party spend according to the organisation's needs. So for example, professional services is commonly a category but it would include legal, HR, marketing and consultancy services. The categories are managed through the life cycle of the goods and services directly um, against those procurement activities. Now strategic sourcing is a major activity within category management but it's only part of it. So it's a structured process to source goods and services and it's applied extensively when sourcing high value and critical goods and services. It has historically had a strong bias towards price reduction to meet savings goals despite the importance of other key issues such as continuity of supply, sustainability and supply development. But other, other activities you'll see in category management do include conventional sourcing, negotiation, contracting and supplier relationship management. So categories are defined by grouping together controllable third party spend. So you can see here the professional services, fleet and IT, but underneath that there will be several subcategories. Strategic sourcing is integral to a business in both public and private sectors. It does ensure value for money in the public sector and profitability in the private sector. Strategic sourcing is achieved through an evaluation of demand downstream in the supply chain and management of suppliers upstream in the supply chain. So, so strategic sourcing is responsible for embedding sustainability along the length of the supply chain. It covers demand management, supplier management, total cost of ownership, sustainability and risk. So we're now going to look at the benefits of category management. By bundling items into categories, it's possible to deliver the organisation's core strategic objectives. And the benefits of category management have been well documented and proven as best practice. You can achieve better pricing and improved terms. Fewer supply contracts, consolidating into contracts that where you can generate additional value, better relationships. Increased stakeholder satisfaction. Better spend visibility, so you can see what, where your money's being spent, who with and on what. You can put in place processes to help you reduce risks and plan for contingency measures. And reveal opportunities for innovation in the supply chain. But there are three main enablers. These enablers will help you towards successful category management. You need people, tools and technology. And then category management is supported with procurement policies, procedures, strong governance, 
clearly defined roles and responsibilities, stakeholder involvement and performance measurement and benefits tracking. Now, an important element of category management is the concept of total cost of ownership, or sometimes called whole life cost. It's a structured approach that calculates the full cost associated with buying or using an asset or acquiring it over its entire life cycle. So it's an important underlying principle in category management because it takes the purchase cost of an item or service into account, but also considers installation, maintenance, repairs, training and support, which are often known as the hidden costs. So an example is a car or a printer, where the life cycle costs can be many times more the purchase price. So when a category profile and plan have been completed, the plan must be executed. Market intelligence must be used to make improvements to the specification, to find new suppliers or change the scope of work. This knowledge can be used to effectively manage both strategic sourcing and conventional purchasing. But category management is a strategic approach. It focuses on the majority of your organization's spend. And if applied effectively throughout the entire organizations, the results can be significantly greater than transactional purchasing. So it starts with category prioritization and assessment. So you need to gather and analyze your spend information here, review your current relationships, understand your stakeholders, the market, to access category level benefits and prioritize your category engagement. And cross-functional teams are an integral part of successful category management. A typical cross-functional team comprises of your internal clients, the subject matter experts, relevant members of the procurement and sourcing team, and any other affected parties. We're now going to look at the stages of a conventional sourcing process. Now, in a conventional process, the typical approach is to solicit bids and achieve the lowest price. This process can be and is often carried out by non-procurement staff. They could be following guidelines that are set by procurement. Now, conventional sourcing uses volumes as a lever, uh, the primary lever. But the process may not result in a supplier contract or a service level agreement. But by contrast, strategic sourcing will assess the market, the internal needs, develop your sourcing strategies, identify qualified suppliers regardless of location, and it engages in a structured sourcing process. Now, transactional procurement differs in that trans I suppose tr transactional procurement consists of routine actions like materials requirement planning, invoicing and documentation. The focus on achieving value when the materials or service are first produced, which procurement have spent more time maintaining that value. But while these are important, they are minimal in comparison to the value of strategic procurement the va that procurement adds in terms of um, business processes. So in transactional procurement, the value add is greatest at the point at which procurement approach the market, whereas the level of effort is greater when managing the contract. So you can see the curve, this is the value added. We only really add in value in a transactional pro procurement when we're approaching the market, but then far more, far more effort is needed when you're managing the relationship. So let's look at that now, what it looks like when you do strategic procurement. So it focuses on the analytical aspects of business operations, which in the long run add more value. It's essential for businesses to analyze the material requirements. Then they source that in terms of relationships with suppliers, making sure they can meet the requirements of the business. So value is added, at the, at, at, I suppose, 
it's lowest when approaching the market, but the analysis ensuring high value add once the contract is in place. So the level of effort is highest when analysing all the factors as procurement approach the market. So you can see how that completely changes. So here you can see some differences between tactical and strategic sourcing. The tactical purchasing is buying on an ad hoc basis as and when need arises. A simple way of understanding this is it doesn't involve the buyer building a relationship with the supplier. And this differs from the strategic procurement. In strategic procurement, the buyer needs to add and build the value and maintain the relationship with the supplier. So the transactional one, the buyer concentrates on just buying the goods and services in the present rather than considering what it might need in the future. So you'll look for negotiating prices to ensure you get the best deal. It's more straightforward, I guess, in terms of a method of buying, but it is important it, because it differs from strategic sourcing, which is where the value can be added for the business. Now the Pareto principle is tried and tested management technique that aids decision making by using the 80-20 principle. The premise is that you've got limited number of activities, i.e. 20%, that can generate 80% of the value. It's particularly relevant in procurement. A small number of categories represents the majority of your total spend and a small number of suppliers cause a disproportionate number of problems. In the procurement function, the Pareto principle means that 20% on average of your organisational suppliers account for 80% of the spend. And it's evolved into the 80-20 rule where limited resources need to be focused on where they can deliver the best results. Now the Crowdjet matrix is often used when transitioning from conventional to strategic sourcing. It's one of the most effective ways to deliver accurate spend segmentation. Profit impacts describes the effect of a supply item on the bottom line. So a breakdown in the single source supply of a vital item or service can destroy a business. For certain areas of low impact spend like stationery, they only have to have a negligible impact on the profit. Supplier risks relate to the likelihood that an unexpected event in that supply market could happen and disrupt the operations. So for instance, in important areas of spend like information systems for banks, the supplies are critical to the business. And if disruption occurs, the organization will face substantial problems and will probably lose its customers. So you can see the four quadrants here on the Crowdjet matrix. This is basically telling you that your category management approach is probably going to be focused on the top right hand corner, which is your strategic items. You will develop different category strategies for your leverage, non-critical and bottleneck items, but your 80-20 is going to be in the top right hand corner. The leverage ones will be more of a kind of um, tactical, closer tactical relationship because the spend is quite high, but the choice is abundant in terms of who can you who can you buy from. So I guess your approach is going to be completely different. But it's important that you're able to clearly differentiate between a procurement category manager, a procurement account manager, and a customer account manager. A procurement category manager is responsible for the categories of spend. A procurement account manager is responsible for specific suppliers and a customer account manager is responsible for specific customers. And here you can see the category management eight step cycle. This is most commonly followed. And the development of this approach and the focus on optimizing the procurement pro process has meant that suppliers and buyers um, need to manage the tensions in the supplier relationship resulting from demand of lower margins, increased demand of higher service and a weakened negotiation position 
as a result of increased buying alternatives for the organisation. Managing requests for information and signals of change in procurement needs to require the, the supplier account manager to align their sales approach to ensure they can respond appropriately to category management. There are lots of different models for the adoption of category management, but the most common one, which is at the top, is the AT Kearney seven step model. Um, they're a managing consultancy with over 3000 staff working in over 40 countries. And their seven step approach says that first and foremost, you need to profile the categories. So that's how you group spend together, depending on their characteristics. Select your sourcing strategy. Is that a sole source, multi-source, crowdsource, outsource, in-source? Once you understand that, you can then generate your supplier portfolio. So which suppliers are out there that can help you to achieve that strategy? Select your implementation path. Do you want to go for an RFP, an RFQ or an ITT? Then you negotiate and select your suppliers as part of that process. The sixth step is to integrate your suppliers, notifying the successful and the unsuccessful suppliers. And step seven is about benchmarking. So you're, you're going to be monitoring and tracking the performance and metrics of the com commodity or category and incorporating any lessons learned in the current process for any future strategic sourcing. The two icons at the bottom, the first one on the left is for the IBM Institute of Business Value approach. They also have a seven step approach, very similar to AT Kearney um, and the IACCM model, which is the International Association for Contract and Commercial Management. They promote a model um, that's that is basically a business model mapping process, which helps you to achieve the most appropriate sourcing model. Um, they're not as well documented as the AT Kearney model, but you can read up on these if you are interested in the models. We then got the SIPS model. So the SIPS, this is the SIPS um, procurement and supply model that you're seeing on the screen here. So it starts from step one, which is understanding the need and developing a high level spec. The second is market commodity and options. That would include deciding uh, whether you want to make or buy. The third step is developing a, a strategy plan. And the fourth, pre-procurement and market testing and engagement. The fifth stage looks where you're developing documents. So you've got pre-procurement questionnaires and a more detailed specification. Step six, supplier selection to participate in an invitation to tender, request for quote or a negotiation. Number seven is to issue that invitation to tender or quote. Eight is the bidding tender evaluation and validation. And nine will result in contract award. The 10th stage is around warehouse logistics and receipt. And 11 is contract performance, review and continuous improvement. The 12th is about supply relationship management, as well as supply chain management and development. And the final one in the, in the um, instance of assets is asset management, end of life and lessons learned. But this is the SIPS category management model. It consists of six steps which can be applied successfully and it will uh, produce significant categories of spend. So step one in the kickoff. Here you're looking at the scope of the category of it and establishing it together with key stakeholders and any key issues or problems that need to be addressed. Step 2a. Do you have the support and resources and skills to undertake this work? So 2a would look at identifying opportunities, ensuring that you understand the business need and the issues as well as your external marketplace. Do you have a deep understanding of the external marketplace, its trends, its dynamics and an appreciation of our, how organisations position within it? Step 2b, 
is prioritising opportunities based on risk and opportunities. So what risks can be addressed? What priorities make sense of this business? Step three, preparing and presenting your category strategy. Ensuring recommendations are supported by the research and analysis. So does the expected benefits stack up in relation to the anticipated risks and resources required to deliver them? Does the strategy address the business issues and objectives identified at the outset? Step four, implementing the category strategy or change recommendations. So is the implementation and change programme being communicated effectively? Are relationships and supporting structures in place? And are transition risks being effectively managed? Stage five is to maintain. This includes managing supplier relationships and internal stakeholders. You want to monitor their performance. Are risks identified and managed here? Is the strategy delivering the expected benefits? And is performance monitored and are issues effectively managed and resolved? And step six is to improve and enhance, ensuring that the category strategy is still aligned to the needs and priorities of an organisation. Do you have the right internal and external behaviours to generate and deliver change and innovation? Are you aware of any internal and external changes? And do you routinely assess how they might present risks and opportunities? And is the category still aligned to the needs and priorities of your organisation? And here's just a summary of strategic sourcing versus category management. It's worth taking a moment just to pause here just to compare these two different uh, approaches. So now we're going to look at technical skills, but before we do that, it may be helpful to briefly um, look at the difference between hard and soft skills. So hard skills are often um, involving the creation of some form of tangible deliverable, such as a presentation, a report or a dashboard. They're more technical and often make up tools such as spreadsheets and modelling tools. So hard skills are more technical in nature as opposed to soft skills that are less visible and generally relate to interpersonal skills and their challenges. Negotiation involves both technical and behavioural skills. But category management and strategic sourcing are both highly technical activities. Decisions are optimised through behavioural skills and they are identified with technical skills. Behavioural skills may provide the drive for achieving category management or strategic sourcing. But it's technical skills that will wrap and root to the getting, it's how you get there basically. So your technical skills will include understanding your category, having some form of strategic thinking and creative problem solving. Analytical skills, information and database management. You do need to have a basic understanding of risk management, as well as the legal aspects of a contract. Negotiation is a good skill to have as well. You've got project management, as well as contracts and supplier relationship management. Now, the behavioural skills are more the softer side. So here, I mean, it's, it's all to do with, you know, stakeholder management and being able to work within teams. Having the ability to um, communicate effectively and influence and persuade. You need to become what's known as a trusted advisor and a change agent. So people believe that when you enforce a change that it's going to happen and it's for the right reasons. And you will need leadership and skills development. And the reason for that is there's some staffing challenges in procurement and supply. There is a skills shortage uh, and we're facing dynamic challenges and opportunities. And the pace of change, especially when you're using technology, is not slowing down. Market dynamics is playing its part as well. 
as well as the organisational structures. Now the category manager is in charge of delivering strategy for a category. They need to have the following skills. They need to be able to demonstrate commercial acumen. Be capable of robust data analysis and communicating the strategy. They need to be a market intelligent expert in their category and a team player who can work in cross-functional manner to influence important decisions. But I would also say that it's necessary or desirable for a category manager to have high level knowledge of different sourcing processes so they can design a process which is relevant to their specific category. This will ensure maximum value for the organisation by developing the right types of relationships with suppliers. The ability to identify, analyse, assess and mitigate against any risk. Risk can be related to suppliers, your reputation or your contracts. Awareness of com commercial le legal aspects through dedicated legal advice, which may be required to formulate large scale supplier relationships. And good negotiation skills, and I'm not just talking about negotiating on price or necessarily just with suppliers. We, we need to negotiate with our colleagues and cross-functional teams. And it's all about persuading and influencing, exploring positions and alternatives. This will enable you to reach desired outcomes and gain acceptance from all the parties. Thank you for watching.